Hello, everybody. My name is Kanan Townsend, and I serve as the Associate Director and Director of Education and Outreach at the Robert Russo Moton Museum, located in Farmville, Virginia. And this is Moton Live 2022. On this panel, we're going to be focusing on the community impact of the Moton Museum and relationships that we have built and established within and around the broader Prince Edward County Farmville community, as well as in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I am honored here to be joined by three great individuals who I will give in a moment a chance to introduce themselves, but individuals that we've been working with for, for several years at, on, the, on the shorter end of things and even longer on the longer end of things. Um, so without further ado, let me let them introduce themselves. So Quincy, if you want to start, and then Jill and then Takin, um, if you'll just introduce yourself and then speak a little bit about your involvement within the community, and we'll kind of stop there and we'll go after that. Absolutely. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Quincy Goodine. I am the Assistant Director of Leadership Development and Multicultural Affairs at Longwood University, so just down the road. Um, and like Kanan said, it's been a kind of an ongoing collaboration between uh, at least our office and the museum for a number of years, whether it be um, using the space to host events just to have a place for, for community, whether it be facilitating discussions or uh, tours or award ceremonies, whatever the case may be, we try to weave Moton in when we can. Um, but on a on a on a different note, um, I serve on a couple of of committees and councils at the Moton Museum as well, just trying to find ways to bridge bridge the two a little bit better. Um, find that connection where we can really build that bridge between Longwood's community and um, the Moton Museum. Uh, as far as the community uh, involvement goes, um, I have worked. With a couple of organizations in the community, Habitat for Humanity, a local YMCA, um, one of my favorite people to, or one of my favorite groups to work with, excuse me, is a Virginia Cooperative Extension, uh, working in the community garden over on Virginia Street. But I don't want to talk too much. I'll pass it off to, to the next uh, great speaker today. Hello, everybody. My name is Jill Ahmad. I am president and owner of United Community Nexus. We are a community engagement and outreach services LLC. And we uh, focus on bridging gaps and building bridges. We love to connect the community uh, with services and programs they otherwise may not have access to. And so our passion uh, involves fellowship with uh, even strengthening the synergy between programs, government and local and state uh, programs and services and um, organizations like the Moton Museum, its history, helping people really truly understand their connection to uh, uh, the civil rights movement and the Barbara Rose John story. Um, it's very inspiring, motivating, and it actually gives a blueprint to building and growing and strengthening our community. And so um, I look forward to this opportunity to love on Moton and talk about the work that we do. Hello everyone, I am Tykeen Cooper and I am a native of Prince Edward County. Um, and so I grew up before the Moton Museum was a museum. And I remember playing uh, baseball and soccer down on the fields, it was Mary Branch Fields back in the day. And, um, I'm just, I'm excited to see the, the journey that this museum has made over the years and about the things that are coming. I remember I first became aware of um, the student walkout in Prince Edward County back, I, I think I was four or five years old and my family and I, we went to the mall and my father got a hat made at one of the stands in the mall, R.R. Moton High School was purple and gold. I was like, wow, like, I don't even know this school. Um, I knew it as the Mary Branch field, but I didn't know the school. And um, my parents have always been adamant about experimental learning. Um, and so I had to do a book report. And I found one of my, so I'm the youngest child by 15 years. So one of my older siblings had a, a term paper, as it was called back then. Um, about the student walkout. So I remember reading that. I remember reading Mr. Wiley's, part of Mr. Wiley's book. And then I saw some of the long-term impact that the closing of schools had in our community. Um, and so I, I've always tried to support the museum in any way that I possibly can. Thank you all for that. And I think that that's a, taking a great, a great transition. If you're willing to, to start kind of this next one, just 
if you can all kind of just look back and just recap and in, in, in a sense your first time interacting with the museum whether that's a program whether that's just kind of casually driving by and coming in you know what was kind of your first interaction experience with the Moat museum and what was that experience like so um i remember hearing some of my sisters talk about i think they actually went to school at the museum um but my first real interaction with it um i guess i was nine ten years old and you know i i'd read some of the papers um i knew about fuqua which was the academy and at that time a lot of people were still referring to it as the academy or the school on the hill but i was sitting in my mom's office one evening and this gentleman came in and um my mom was working with another client and he said, Hey, nephew, I, I left my glasses in my apartment. Will you, uh, can you read this paper for me? So I read it to the best of my ability. And then it was, it was a summer day. And, um, so I read it to the best of my ability and then he looked extremely confused. I don't know if it was me, uh, <laughs> and, and my reading or what, but so he's like, so what does that mean? And so I explained it to him which I'm sure I did a really poor job of doing, but it was a letter from Department of Social Services. And, um, and so that just really stood out to me. And so I remember asking my mom that evening, I said, hey, uh, he can't read, can he? And she was like, you know why? And then like, she kind of jarred my memory. And so um, I had a book report due to her at the end of that summer. So I would bounce my basketball to uh, the library at Longwood and research stuff. And then like I had to submit a book report. So that was my first real understanding and connecting the dots of everything that happened. It's kind of dramatic, but it means a lot to me. Um, <clears throat> I have to go back a little bit. I'm fr originally from Washington, DC. Um, my, I live in Charlotte County. Um, my uh, three of my four kids went to uh, Southside Virginia Community College. Upon graduation, my two daughters went to Longwood. And so that took me from Keysville into Farmville. I would be the Uber mom. So I was the, you know, this is before United Community Nexus. This is before, you know, me really getting involved in the community. So I would drop them off and I'd go chill at the library and wait till it was time to pick them up and leave. Well, one day I met, um, of uh, one of your uh, chronic volunteers, Patricia Carter, at um, I think in the park or somewhere. And I met her and she, we were talking and she said, well, let's go get coffee. And I was like, There's, where can we get coffee? And it took me to Uptown Cafe, fell in love with them. And then she said, well, you haven't walked around? And I said, no, for four years. You have to understand. We're talking about three years I was coming into Farmville. You know, and I would just sit drop them, you know, each semester. So she takes me, she says, this is where you got to go. I pass by Moten every day. I said, okay, it's a school. She said, no, it's a museum. She took me inside and told me the story. And I'm, I'm all impressed with the setup. And I come from the Smithsonian institutions. You know, we regulate the Smithsonian museums. So it triggered something in me, the story, the history, you know, this happened by who, how old, what? Oh, it was on. Once I left, I lie to you not, my vision, just the whole view of the town just completely changed. The dynamic starts to change. When you start thinking about the families impacted by the school closings and, and so on, and, and then um, opportunities started to come up to volunteer. And one of my first community events was the Moten Banquet. What? It totally blew my mind. I had the opportunity of really connecting with community leaders like Megan Clark. And she said, well, come on, come sit at my table. And um, just seeing the, uh, our uh, Black community so engaged, so involved, highly educated, highly busy in community service, that moment I became a fellow chronic volunteer and Moten had everything to do with it. Um, you guys epitomize 
um, learning and empowerment and fellowship and bringing together and availability and inclusion. And coming from DC was extremely refreshing. So that impact uh, that my experience at Moton, I assure you, plays a huge part into the community work that we do today. And I love you guys. You already know. Don't get me into groupy mode. Okay. I'm just. My first introduction to, to just Farmville in general, actually, uh, when you were speaking, Takin, uh, it, it jogged my memory as well. Uh, many, many years ago, I was a, a halfway decent athlete. And um, uh, the school that I played for was in a district um, or I guess a conference or whatever have you, uh, the same as, as Fuqua. So I had been coming to, to Farmville, Prince Edward, on a, on a regular basis and had no idea where I was playing at, uh, you know, when we came to Fuqua to play them uh, or the history behind it. Um, so to, to choose to come to Longwood and, and see that Fuqua, you know, the, the, all of the connections that existed there was, was, kind, of, was kind of interesting. And then I would say probably not until my sophomore year um, when I got involved with uh, an organization on, on our campus uh, called the Black Student Association. And we took a trip. One of our meetings was dedicated to taking a trip to the Moat Museum. Um, everything started to connect, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the significance of, of Fuqua, the significance of the place that we were standing in and, and hearing the stories and the history and the names associated with it. Um, it, it all kind of came full, full circle, even, even Longwood's involvement in, in, in the matter, if, if we're speaking candidly. Uh, but I think, honestly, for me, what really drove it home was even after I had taken the tour, um, at this point, I had taken a number of tours, but I got to meet Reverend Williams. Um, and I just sat and listened. I don't, I don't think I even asked a question. I just sat and just was a sponge to, to his experience and to what he was talking about and, and all that took place and, and how he was a part of it. Um, and again, I think that was that was really what drove the, the point home, because um, I think to, to your point, Jill, this is not something that happened, you know, a hundred, you know, hundreds of years ago. This is something that still uh, is very relevant. And the people who are affected by it um, are still alive and kicking and, and here, despite the pictures being in black and white and everything. Um, and there was there was definitely aftermath and a trickle down effect, um, which which plays into some things I'm, I'm sure we'll probably discuss a little bit later on. But yeah, that, that was my introduction into the Moat Museum, the Prince Edward community, um, and, and Farmville as a whole. Yeah, no, and, I, and I appreciate all of your answers and kind and positive thanks towards Moton, of course. I think to go off, I mean, all of your points, really, I mean, there's an element, I think, of, of the stars kind of aligning. Like, I, I don't want to say coincidence, because I think it, that makes it seem very random. And I don't think that it was random any of the way that either of you all did. I mean, Jill, to a certain extent, but I don't, I don't think that the randomness does it justice. I think it was a bit of predetermination and a bit of all three of kind of you all happening upon Moton in the way that, that you did. Um, so, so for me personally, you know, so my, my dad was locked out of schools. And so I knew that history growing up, but I didn't know the before. I had never heard really of Barbara Johns, you know, similar to Taquin, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the museum wasn't quite open yet, you know, we opened in 2001. So, you know, by the time I'm getting out of middle school, out of elementary school, going in the middle, and, you know, it still wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't what we know it as today. So we didn't really interact that much. So it really wasn't until college, really, that I had my first kind of formal exposure to this. And I was just like, what, huh, who, how did this, how do I not know more about this? I mean, certainly the school closes I did, because a lot of and I'm, I'm sure Taki might have a similar experience. And a lot of the people who worked at Prince Edward County Schools, um, a decent amount were themselves impacts of the school closures. Um, so I had a few teachers and I remember, um, and I was telling the story the other day, I remember during Black History Month, uh, every year we, they would, uh, our teachers, a lot of our teachers would form a, a choir and they would sing, lift their voice and sing. Uh, and, 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 and it didn't, the significance and the weight of that song in general, but then the people who were singing it, didn't ever really click until I was much older because as a child you're just like yeah you know go ahead y'all doing that singing thing again whatever but like looking back I'm just like whoa like these group of people who were impacted by this history here who are singing this song that means so much to people who look like me I just I, I get goosebumps thinking about those connections of like man I wish I took it a little bit more seriously um, back in the day but for me yeah, it really wasn't until college which is unfortunate but um, I do think we do a better job today of, of really kind of getting that message out there and getting the history um, out there. So to pivot just a little bit, um, you've all kind of I've mentioned this a, a bit, but I want to just talk to you all for a minute about what, how do you all define community? And then 
what is the importance of Moton, the idea of Moton, the museum itself, the physical building? What is the importance of the museum Moton to the broader community? I'll, I'll jump in real quick then. Um, <clears throat> but I will say, I think community is, uh, for me, again, our personal definition is correct. Uh, I think where, where, where one feels that that overwhelming sense of belonging. Um, it, it could be geographical, it could be with a particular group, it could be, you know, wherever or whoever. Um, but I think it's where you feel that sense of connectedness, where you don't have to fit in, but where you where you feel like this is this is home, um, even if it's not home. As far as the significance of the Moton Museum, uh, I, I think what really always uh, strikes me every time I go to the Moton Museum is that um, at, at any given moment, when I'm, as I'm walking through the museum, I'm, I'm standing in a place where history took place. I could be standing in a place where Barbara Johns herself stood. Um, and that, that's, you know, I think that that's what makes Moton different to me than a lot of other museums, um, is that I'm standing in the room where it happened, right? Um, and I, I think that's what, that's, what is continue, that's what continues to inspire me um, each time I go in there, even if it's not to take a tour, like I said, if we're hosting an event or doing something with students, just to know that I'm in a place where something nation changing uh, took place. Uh, that That's what stands out to me each time I step foot in the Moat Museum. To kind of continue where Quincy left off, you know, because um, he said belonging and I was like, okay, I was going to say belonging, but uh, uh, community to me um, my definition in my spirit involves um, like minds um, coming together. I have a very strong belief that knife, like minds, they build. It's, uh, it's my line, but I didn't create it. Um, a sense of fel uh, people who have come together who have a sense of fellowship, shared interests, shared goals, but I, I really think what's important is we have to realize that community is a group of individuals who really rely on each other to function. Um, a sense of unity is necessary. So when we have individual silos within the community, um, those are considered breaches because we're all one, we are in this together. And I believe community um, relies on that. Anyone who is in proximity to one another we are relying on one another to exist, to function, to flourish, and fellowship plays a very huge part in that. Um, in regards, uh, one of the importance of Moton is that in, even if in my travels, um, people may not realize it, and they're realizing it more and more, that it is a safe place. It is a safe place where you can come and learn and I'm gonna use that word fellowship again because it invites people to break bread together, to have difficult conversations. Um, it gives people creative uh, inspiration. I mean, so many authors have been supported by Moton for their books and artists and um, all forms of art, all forms of learning. Um, it is a place where when I have an event, um, they uh, actually, I didn't initially choose Moton, but I was in a bind and they just stepped in and made it happen. But um, so many different groups were present and they felt safe there. And so I'll, I will say that that's, that's what Moton does for the community, um, one aspect it does for the community, yes. Yeah, community for me, uh, definitely want to echo that sentiment about belonging, but also, um, I think one thing that's really important is that you don't always have to agree and still be in community with one another. And um, I think that's been one of the powerful things about Moton. Um, I think it served as a place of healing for people who were um, as cliche as this has become, but people who are on both sides of uh, the travesty of not educating students in Prince Edward County from 59 to 64. I remember being at one of the brown bag lunches several years ago now. And um, we had some, some difficult conversations. I think this was probably like the summer of 2014. So this was in the height of the Ferguson protests. Um, and 
during this like brown bag luncheon, we had a student, a, a former Prince Edward County student who graduated 2000, 2001, but he talked about how he believed that his, um, he ran for student body president, student government, and um, the election was rigged against him. And there was a, a woman there who began to cry and she validated something that he had thought for, you know, at that time, 12 or 13 years. And she said that it did happen because she was part of it. And it was just amazing to see him finally put down that burden. And for her, like it looked like she was liberated by just acknowledging that it had happened and that and she said, I never realized that something that we thought was so trivial um, could have affected you and you were still thinking about it to this day. And, you know, I think that's just a testament to the fact that Moden is this place that I think people genuinely respect. Um, and so people let their guards down, they put down their preconceived notions when they hit the door. And folks are willing to listen, uh, to learn, and to actually talk with each other. Um, and so I guess, what was it now? 2019 came in. I was part of the conversation there, uh, one of the initial conversations there about a formal apology from Fuqua. And I thought that was, you know, I was just thankful to be in there that day and play a small role in that, but really to just have my two ears listening to People like Mr. Reed and um, Mr. and Mrs. Walker talk about like the pain and then for Fuqua to, to say, hey, like it's time for us to truly acknowledge the harm that we've done to this community. And you know, I think that was, a, that was a big step because for far too long, um, our community has ignored that anything ever happened. And then some people say, hey, we should just move on. And you don't truly address a problem. Like in the 12 steps of recovery, I used to be a substance abuse counselor. Like step one is that you have to acknowledge it, right? And I think that's one of the big things here when we talk about truly healing and forgiveness. Um, we have to start from the same sheet of music and say, hey, there was a problem and this is where we go from here. Yeah, and, it, and it's it's important that you bring that up, Takeem, because I, I, I think back to, the mid late nineties, granted, I wasn't paying attention at that point, but when this building stops, you know, it stops being used as a school. Uh, and so this talks of, you know, what is this gonna become, right? Is it gonna be torn down and turned to a parking lot? Uh, is it gonna be a residence hall? Is it gonna become a Denny's, who knows, right? Like, but there was talk of it no longer being the space and, and the foresight of community members, you know, Mark Lee Forrester Council of Women to recognize that this is an important space. You know, they could see they could see backwards and see what the space was, but also to be able to see forward and what this place could potentially become. And, and, and so to see kind of that, you know, and all the issues of purchasing this building and such to now, which we can be a place where people from all different kind of ideologies, all different backgrounds, all different races, religions, et cetera, can come together and, and talk and communicate and have these difficult conversations is just an amazing thing to have witnessed part of, by, you know, by being here. Um, I remember my first kind of formal involvement with the museum. I was an intern in college. Uh, and so I was interning here. And that was around the time of, and Taki, I'm sure you remember this, and, and, and maybe maybe Quincy as well, um, about talking about the partnership between Longwood and, and the museum. And there was tremendous pushback, uh, uh, to say the, the least. In fact, one of my first tasks was to just stand at the video camera and record. Uh, one of the public meetings and I was just like uh what did I get, get myself into <laughs> I remember thinking man and then the battery died I was like oh I, I, I'm just gonna soak it all in because it was it was intense uh but just to go from that point uh you know to to now um and certainly it's slow during COVID and but still to be the place where we can have those type of conversations and bring together all different types of people to be on the U.S. of rights trail to be in marketing materials for Prince Edward County and town of Farmville I mean this is not something that would have happened 10 15 years ago um you know and and so I just think that's amazing um 
put my tangents aside. Um, I, I will keep going, but I appreciate all of you all's answers. Very insightful. And this, I think, has the, the, the potential to be very insightful as well. So kind of going into contemporary, you know, modern times, you know, what, like, what are some of the biggest issues that you all think that, that our community either specifically, you know, small scale or, or broadly faces? Um, and this can be just something that you're, all of you all do work with specific populations, um, well, not specific, but broad populations, but what are some big issues, your big passions, issues that you're passionate about that kind of exist in the community, kind of as you defined it, or broader than that uh, today? Well, uh, I'll start here. You know, I think one of the big issues um, is education, of course. And so in some ways, here we are, um, you know, 71 years from the student walkout, and we're still dealing with the, like, it's, it's repeating itself. You know, contrary to popular belief, the students didn't walk out to desegregate schools in Prince Edward County. And that's something I tried to, to share all over the Commonwealth. You know, the students, from my research, uh, the students walked out protesting the separate and unequal conditions. And so, you know, throughout the Commonwealth now, we still have divisions. Um, with separate and unequal conditions, right? And you know the print the the conditions of the Prince Edward County Public Schools are deplorable. Um, I think that's the nicest way I can put it. And so, beyond the physical structure of schools, you know, I I don't think we are in the Commonwealth. I don't think we're doing the best job of educating our students, and you know, there leaves much to be desired there. So, education is a big one, and you know, I think the other thing in our community is um, the economy and jobs. And so how do we find ways to truly um, help people help themselves? And, um, you know, I think those two things are intertwined. You know, when I, when I worked for a business in Prince Edward County, um, it was extremely difficult to recruit outsiders to, to come to the community because of the condition of the schools um, and school rankings. And so we sometimes we couldn't get candidate our top three candidates and sometimes we had to take the fourth candidate or we had to um, we could only hire people who didn't have who didn't have children. Those were the only people who were willing to come to Prince Edward County because they would read and say, well, I don't think Fuke was a great fit for my kids because of the history and I don't think Prince Edward will meet my children's needs. And so um, I think we're gonna have to make some investments in our schools and I think that will dovetail to a lot of other things we need in Prince Edward County and greater Farmville. And I exhale, my actions, you know, we are actually focusing on those areas that are a concern to me in the community. Uh, I am the coalition lead for the Piedmont Alliance for the Prevention of Substance Abuse. We service, our catchment area is the Piedmont region. We are currently building the coalition to include the 12 plus sectors. And um, so it has afforded us the opportunity to be at the table where um, the, uh, the Centra's needs assessment was discussed. And Substance abuse is very important to uh, our coalition, our focus, the members are all speaking about the youth and substance misuse and the availability of prevention services, treatment and recovery services in the area, which really we don't have um, a very strong um, presence or place to send folks. Um, the housing crisis is a concern being a member of the South Central Virginia Nonprofit Network and working with STEPS and their homeless task force, trying to really having to build something um, to uh, tackle uh, the homeless uh, situation in our region, uh, because we have, I believe we lost a homeless uh, shelter that serviced our region not too long ago. And so that definitely has put our community in flux. Affordable housing seems to be a challenge. So we are all working together to um, being able to be at the table of, of some very 
uh, powerful, like-minded individuals and watching the process of them recognizing that this is a challenge, but also recognizing that our community is in denial of some of these challenges. And if I could go back in regards to uh, substance misuse and mental health, um, community, um, community readiness and coalition effectiveness is a theme for us this year. But we're finding that, again, there is a denial about the seriousness of the opioid use uh, with the decriminalization of marijuana has uh, bought up awareness with the high THC chronic usage amongst our youth, Delta 8 and Delta 10 products being sold right in our local gas stations or close proximity to schools or places where there's youth. So right now, we would like to see um, homelessness, affordable housing, um, an increase in substance misuse and mental, mental health services for youth and families. Um, and people are diligently working on these issues that are a very serious passion for me uh, right now, but also the transportation issue. Because once solutions are established, we got to get folks there. And so that's being tackled as well. Um, so, you know, just reaching out to the community, encouraging the community to get involved, to speak up, to participate in these assessments and surveys. Um, because I don't even think transportation made top 10 after the needs assessment. Um, but we're working on it, uh, and I say we very loosely, I'm meaning um, the, the, the very strong group of nonprofits. Again, it's the South Central Virginia Nonprofit Network. It's about 25 of our larger nonprofits are involved with that. But these are the community passions that we're focusing on um, in, in my little uh, bubble. And um, I do hope that we can get the support or continued support from everyone to be involved in that. I would uh, I would echo what both uh, Jill and Takeen said in terms of uh, their, their ideas of things that need to change. I would also add to that list. And again, I, I'm not steep, so please feel free to jump in and, and correct me if I'm speaking uh, uh, out of turn or my, my facts are outdated. Um, but I would also say the last time I looked at uh, some of the numbers for voter engagement, um, I think that we could definitely, uh, I, there's some ways that that could be addressed as well. And I say that not solely for the purpose of going out and exercising your right to vote, but uh, also making making your voice heard. Uh, and I say that in terms of local elections, I'm not sure what the numbers are for, for state and um, uh, national elections, but the last time I looked at some things locally, it was like, hmm, I'm sure there are a lot more people in this area than, <laughs> than who turned out to, to vote. And I think that, um, by exercising that right and making your voice heard and, and showing up in that way that that could at least start the process of addressing some of the other things that we've been talking about, whether it be for substance abuse or economic and education um, advancements as well. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to pivot to, to long with just a bit, but um, one of the, the, the things that I, that I see is that if you look at at, at long with even including the Moton Museum uh, here more recently, there's a there's a triangle. Um, and it, it seems like uh, there's not really a lot of thinking outside of the triangle. Um, and when I what I say uh, what I mean when I say that is it seems like when we, we were on campus, we're focused on all things Longwood. We're not focused on the community in which Longwood exists. Um, and uh, I, like to use a word that Joe said earlier, there, there's a silo there uh, when you have folks that see themselves as long with students and not sort of members of the Farmer Prince Edward community during their time while they're on campus, uh, you tend to not really uh, see community. Uh, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't feel that sense of belong. I don't belong to this community. I don't belong to this, this county. I, I just, I only do my thing on Longwood's campus. And then after that, I don't really have any other responsibilities. Um, I, I have my, I have my grievances with, with the use of the word, the word townie. Um, so again, th th things like that, right? Um, so, so I guess I, I'm saying a lot just to say, how do we, again, how do we, how do we bridge that? How do we get people to be involved and to care about the, the time that you're spending here? How do you give back? What is your responsibility to this community? It's not just here to, to, to be a sponge and just soak up, but how do we create a reciprocal relationship in which I can learn from the community which I'm existing outside of this triangle, outside of this Longwood triangle, but also um, give up, give up my talents. What can, how can I leave my mark? I'm here for four or five years. You know, some people choose to stay longer than that, whatever the case may be. But what do I do 
to 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 give of myself to to this place that I'm here um, gaining so much from. Definitely, and I and I appreciate that. I mean, and in, in the silos, yeah, I, I, that's a big a big issue. You know, on campus, outside of campus, people just don't. I don't know. We, we're all in the sandbox and we're all in our respective corners instead of trying to pull together resources and especially if we have common goals. I mean, that's that's always kind of a big issue. Um, so my, my last kind of question, and it kind of dovetails a bit off of the, the this previous question, and I've reworked it a little bit, so I know y'all got them beforehand, but I'm, I'm tweaking it a little bit. So look forward to 2051. And the reason I picked that year, that's the 100th anniversary of the student walkout of 1951. Um, and so looking forward, that's 29 years from now. What, where, where do you hope to see this community in, 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 in that time period? Where in 2051 do you hope that we are with regards to the issues you mentioned or, or other issues or, you know, what progress do you hope that we will have made by then? What changes, you know, and, and is there a way in which Moten can, can assist with, with that potentially? Um, so where do you hope that we are, will be broadly as a community in 2051? And, and really do you see a way for in which Moten can, can assist or, or help to get to that point? And, I, and, then, and then let me, uh, I'll, I'll start because I, I know I changed the last question a little bit. So I want to give you a moment to think. Um, I, mean, I mean, for me, I mean, and I'm very similar to Taikin. I mean, education is probably the top of my list. Um, I won't go into to huge detail in case, in case he wants to. But education is probably my first and foremost thing. Like Jill mentioned, affordable housing, um, you know, Quincy mentioned, silos right and working together i mean i really hope that the museum in 29 years from now can be a place where you come to learn history you can come to continue have have those conversations and advance narratives and to talk about these issues that are persisting you know which some of which we we do now but i'm always conscious of the people who are not coming into the museum right i'm, I'm very conscious for programs for tours and whatever else because for so many of these programs and events, it's great. We have a lot of different people who think a lot of different ways. However, these are not necessarily the people who need, need, need to be here. Everybody needs to be here, certainly, but you know, I, I'm very conscious of those viewpoints. You know, the, the the people who wanted the schools to close down, right? Like, what about them? What about that ideology? What about that mindset? We I would love to get some people in there, even if they disagree with me, right? And that's fine. But to continue to have those conversations and to talk about how those issues have evolved into the issues that we have now, hopefully by 51, 2051, which is very weird to say, um, we won't continue to be talking about the exact same things we're talking about today. You know, hopefully some things have, have improved. But I, I see Moton to continue to be the anchor of, of the community where people can come and, and have those conversations and to talk and to hopefully come up with some action items to fix some of these some of these issues. I mean, I would love on a museum side of things for Moton to be the the scholarly hub for civil rights during this era. Like I would love for people from New York, from California, from Florida, from wherever across the country, across the world, when like, okay, I want to come study civil rights movement and the broader implications that that might have on a community for Moton to be one of the first names that they they mentioned. I mean, I don't think that we're that far off. It's just about accumulating the resources, but the stories are there. The history is, is there. The implications are, are here, right? So what better case study than to use Prince Edward County as that uh, for plenty of people who are studying this history to come in. I, I would love for Moton to be the repository for that history uh, kind of broadly um, and locally. And I, I want Prince Edward County history to be here in, in Prince Edward County. Um, so if we want to study that, I want people to have to come here to, to do that. So anyways, I, hopefully I've given enough time to process a, a bit because I know I did tweet the question, but whoever, I think Jill is unmuted. So if you want to go ahead, Jill. Um. Uh, 2051, um, I would like to see um, that we would have established um, a consistent continuum of care for uh, community members who are um, living with mental health and substance misuse disorders, that there is a safe place to go. And this place has, um, something for everyone, um, a place to, to, to recuperate and recover, um, that uh, the community is cleaned up so those in recovery can, um, can apply um, 
their second chances. I would love to see um, established facilities for the homeless, um, an improved process with our um, access to healthy foods, um, but primarily for our youth that the, um, that holistically, anything that is associated with that youth, you know, that they have help, um, a proper homes, a proper school, proper programs to keep them busy, to give them choices. These things exist now, but not everyone has access. Not everyone is able to take advantage. I know that the Farmville Rec has uh, returned the summer camps. I would like to see down the road where they receive the funding where uh, youth can participate at no cost um, and or that there are uh, a larger amount of uh, scholarships so that they may participate. Um, and then I'd love to see an improved uh, transportation system where the rural can uh, get to their doctor's appointments and the jobs that are that are available, but out of the area um, or out of you know, not walking distance from where they live because we're so spread out. I would like to see the homeless uh, village that's being proposed right now uh, in place, uh, not just transitional housing, but um, their uh, semi-permanent housing that they're uh, proposing. So uh, that would be an amazing piece to see our community functioning as one. Uh, that would be awesome. Well, Kanan, it's it's funny that you, uh, when you were sharing your your ideas, I, I kept thinking, man, he and I are of like mind on this. Um, <laughs> for a, a little while now, I've always thought to myself, uh, what if we were to have a civil rights and social justice research center somewhere in town, um, and, and how great that would be for us to kind of bring that national attention, but also cement ourselves as that hub that you were mentioning. Um, this is a place that you can come to and do uh, good quality research on something that kind of predated the civil rights movement as, as we know it, correct? So um, I, I just, I think about that often. Um, of, of course, it, it could, it could, it could uh, boost, um, you know, uh, retention along with whatever the case may be. But I really just think about what, what it could do for the community, a place for folks to kind of come and learn more about it. Um, something that something that uh, continues to stick out in my mind is I used to be a, a, a mentor when I was at Longwood as well. Um, again, long, long time ago. And now we, we mentor specifically young men who were trying to, who, who were thinking about life after they graduated uh, from Prince Edward County High School, whether it be going into the workforce, pursuing trade or choosing school. Um, and so one of the days we kind of had it outlined to talk about the history of Prince Edward County. And um, the, the young man didn't know who Barbara Johns was. Um, and that, that kind of stuck out to me. I have no idea how I handled it in the moment. So forgive me if I, if I, if I you know, didn't handle that the best, but that, that stuck out to me as well. Like I, I've, I've been here for a year, two years and have kind of you know, immersed myself into at least trying to learn more about what took place here and, and uh, this person may have not been exposed to it or maybe just for whatever reason did not know who Barbara Johns was or the significance of what she did or, or the Moton Museum. So kind of since then, I've been kind of thinking to myself, what would it look like to have a resource like that on uh, somewhere in Farmville, somewhere in Prince Edward, where both of our, both of our uh, K-12 schools can, can come and learn more about it. Certainly Moton could have a, a, a huge hand in it. Longwood, Hampton, Sydney. Um, but again, uh, overall, like you said, just that national attention to, um, uh, again, just what took place here and why it's so significant. Um, and we can focus on the past. Again, in 2051, a lot of time will have passed. And what can we do to kind of um, chart a path forward in the future as well? So, you know, one of the pie in the sky ideas that I have uh, for Prince Edward County I think that we should have um, a scholarship available for students who graduate from Prince Edward County Public Schools to attend any institution of higher learning, any public institution of higher learning in the Commonwealth for free. Um, and there are other places around the country that have similar um, programs, but I think in a place where students were denied an education and then the intergenerational impact 
of that um, plays a, a monumental role in where we are today. And so I think, um, unfortunately, you know, so many people say, oh, we should just move on. But it's kind of like playing the game of Monopoly, right? And let's say the three of y'all playing the game of Monopoly for a few hours. And then I come in and y'all say, oh, you should play Monopoly with us. But y'all have bought up all the property. And so I'm, I'm starting, we aren't starting from the equal playing field, right? And I think in Prince Edward County, when we say, oh, these kids should be able to learn, I think that's easy to say if you um, if you came home and or we say, oh, parents should parents should do more to help their children learn. It's like that's easy for you to say if you have a parent who could read or write, who weren't denied an education. And so um, I think that intergenerational impact is really, really um, huge. And, you know, I think there are some opportunities in Prince Edward for us to um, build bridges between the community and the institutions of higher learning that we have locally. Um, and so I'd love for us to strengthen the, the partnerships there. You know, as Kane alluded to earlier, it was it was really testy when they when a conversation um, was being held in the community about entering the partnership with Longwood. And so um, I, a lot of those people who were extremely reluctant, I think are really proud of that partnership now. And um, I think that we can build off of some of those things. Economically, um, as you know, kind of talked about earlier, um, education is gonna play a big role in it, but you know, anyone who ever listens to me, I tell them that Prince Edward County is at the epicenter of American progress. And if you think about so many of the um, monumental things that have happened in America, a lot of them have happened within a 30 mile radius of Prince Edward, you know, from Senator Bruce to Israel Hill to um, Brown v. Board. Um, not to mention the Battle of Sailors Creek and then the, the surrender in Appomattox. And so I think that we can really lean into that and say, hey, like, we shouldn't wait for the rest of the country to do this. Like, we've been trailblazers since our inception, and it's time for us to blaze a new trail. And we can talk about, like, some synergistic work centers, some creative co-ops. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities some opportunities to really do some innovative things with uh, recreation, as Jill was alluding to. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm extremely excited. Um, I'm grateful for the things that have happened in my 33 years. Um, and like Prince Edward County has come a mighty long way. And, you know, I think that's a testament to a lot of different people and their leadership. And I think that uh, we should not become stagnant or complacent, and we should continue pushing the envelope and doing things that our community needs. That's brilliant. I, I appreciate all of your words, and I appreciate all the work that you all are doing in the community, because certainly I don't think a lot of this progress happens without people like yourselves who are willing to commit to fixing the issues that, that the community, community might face. And, and yeah, you all are, are, are doing the work, so hopefully this will inspire more people to even if they don't have to know how to start, but to also figure out how they can help to do the work as well. So this has been really, really a great panel. I wanted to give you all uh, a last chance to, uh, if you had anything to say in closing, you know, if you had anything to share in terms of projects and such, and then if you wanted to also maybe share social media or how people can kind of stay, you know, follow you, stay in contact with you and, and, and things like that. Um, or like a website or anything. That's totally up to your preference, but close the statements and then how people can stay up to date with, uh, with, with what you're doing or programs I might have. And I saw Jill, I think she had her hand raised. Thank you. I got kind of hasty there. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, touch on Moten's involvement in the community from me being the outsider coming in and kind of learning the people and establishing the relationships. Um, just the powerful, just over the past 
through the pandemic, um, even in the past few months, we have community members who have dedicated their lives to focusing on the barriers that are preventing our youth from um, taking advantage of the programs and services that are in place, that are available. Um, the role that United Community Nexus plays in trying to connect people to resources and, um, and things like that. But Mo and you guys invest in our entrepreneurial booms by allowing people to come and um, propagate their message and services in, in the museum. Um, you have invested and sponsored various programs and events. You have shown up and been present in the community and supported um, from the Juneteenth programs to just pick anything, um, just seeing your faces. And it makes it easier for people like me to be able to give, well, you know, examples when folks say, well, no one cares about us. Yes, they do. You know, you guys are on the list of folks who have definitely gone above and beyond your mandate to look after uh, the underserved population and the locals and so on. And so I appreciate and value and uh, pray that that continues and that you guys need the resources so that you can, can continue to be there uh, for us. Um, the PAPSA Coalition, as I had mentioned before, um, focusing on, again, those uh, barriers that prevent and, and affect people's quality of life. And substance misuse has a lot of um, outcomes that come from that. Um, you can go to school and you can learn amazing things, but then when you go home, having to manage whether there's food in the house or whether your parents are present, whether you have transportation or whether it's anything to do and the negative influence of, of those who are indulging in um, opioid use, marijuana use, so on and so forth. So um, to promote and you know, to, to definitely continue to support, support our efforts in getting the word out in regards to programs and services, that'd be amazing. Um, and in closing, um, there are like, I think Hampton Sydney has a program I don't want to misspeak. We were listening to the president at uh, at one of our uh, Lions Club lunches, and he was sharing that seniors from Prince Edward County are able to take classes, certain classes for free. And when I heard that, I was trying to figure out thinking, well, I, I thought I knew everything. I don't know everything. Um, we need to kind of do better with that. Um, that network of information, because if funding is out there, if programs are out there, if opportunities are out there, we need a single hub to share that information. And then those people take that into the areas that are not easily accessible so that they can know what's available. I would love to see um, some, some um, collaborations in, in helping making that happen. Um, one of the uh, ways to keep in touch with us right now is on social media. Um, so check out Piedmont Alliance for the Prevention of Substance Abuse on Facebook. You can also check out United Community Nexus on Facebook. April 16th, we have a youth prevention, drug prevention event taking place at the um, sports arena in Farmville. Uh, if anyone's interested in um, providing any kind of support or if you want to love on or speak to the youth, at this point, we're looking at approximately 60 youth have committed to attending and uh, we reached out to the youth groups. I don't know if you know, this area has about seven youth groups and their populations do not blend. So um, bringing them all together and seeing everyone come together is amazing. We do need help getting the school systems to want to support such an effort. Um, but we have collaborated with the Virginia Army National Guard, local police, as well as state police and Richmond police and um, Commonwealth attorneys offices out of Nottaway and uh, Crossroads. And so we've got a nice gambit of people who wanna love on our youth. And um, we would love to have someone like Takin Cooper come and speak to us, but you know, I'm just saying. Thank you guys for your time. I appreciate you all.
Yeah, I, I would just say in terms of, of final thoughts, um, thanks, Kana, for, for thinking of, of us over here at, at Longwood and bringing us into the, to the mix. Thanks for such thought-provoking questions. I did not have uh, those answers readily available. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for asking those and kind of getting the, getting the juices flowing this morning. Um, in terms of uh, staying up to date with what we've got going on, first and foremost, while our office may be under the, the, the umbrella of, of Longwood, uh, we, we try our best to open up everything that we do to anyone who wants to come. Um, so that you don't have to be a part of Longwood community, be a part of community period, and just come in and join us. Um, uh, I think that the, the diversity of thought we, we, can all, we can all benefit from. Um, so be on the lookout for, for, those, for those opportunities. Um, so how you can kind of keep up with those opportunities, Longwood's website, if you just type in multicultural affairs or uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, our, our office should pop up. We try to keep that populated with things we've got going on. Um, if you're on social media, we are, excuse me, on Instagram at uh, Longwood underscore O-M-A. Uh, we with those that is always populated with what we've got going on. We've got interns who are a little younger than I am who are into the gadgets and things. So so there's that. And the same goes for our our Twitter. So if you're looking for us on Twitter as well, it's that same thing. Longwood underscore O M A. Uh, but you can also, like I said, just uh, go to our website if you're not on social media. And yeah, thank you again for your time. Uh. Kanan, thank you so much for, and the Mode Museum, thank you so much for having us this morning. And uh, much like Quincy, I did not, um, I did not look at the questions in advance. So <laughs> you caught me off guard a little bit, uh, but thank you so much for having us. Um, Jill, point taken, uh, send me an invite, I'm happy to come. Um, but I'm the only Takeen Cooper in the world, so I'm easily accessible on any form of social media. And uh, you can follow my work, Virginia Excels. Uh, you can follow our website, virginiaexcels.org. And um, I'm happy to support and help in any way that I can. Well, sincerely, thank you all for, for being here. And thanks to our, our viewers. I'm going to, in, in post, I'll, I'll add your handles and stuff. I can, I can do that. That way people can see those a bit easier. Um, but thank you all so much for watching this session and more stuff to come. Thanks. Have a great day.